Welcome back. I'm James Kennedy. Dr. Jack Quazzo joins us today. His many years of research are detailed in his book, Buried Alive, the startling truth about Neanderthal man. Well, in 1987, I became interested in the subject of growth and development of children. I had realized that in the earlier years of my practice in the 60s, children didn't seem to be developing as fast as they were in the 80s. I saw children coming into my office in the 70s and the 80s that were developing very quickly. I always take a record, a medical record from the parents, particularly for girls, uh, because they are developing a little faster than boys, but boys are also developing fast, and found that there were many girls reaching their first menstrual period around 10, 10 and a half years of age. And that was in the 80s. Now, this wasn't so in the early 60s. And I realized that as late 70s and 80s went on, that children seemed just in my office to be developing quicker and quicker. Now, this is a problem for orthodontists because you would like to treat a child in their maximum growth period. And if a girl has her menstrual period at 10 and then she finishes her active growth at, say, 12, you pretty much have an adult after that. And adult orthodontics is not as easy as children's orthodontics. So we had a dilemma. And I wanted to alert the orthodontic community, the dental community, about this. Then, of course, I wondered if the fossil record showed this, and it turns out that it did. So much of your study confirmed that Neanderthal man, instead of showing undeveloped growth characteristics, was actually very advanced in terms of physical abilities. Yeah, the um, problems that you face today are all based upon, our medical problems are all based upon the fact that our body is falling downhill quite a distance uh, from what we were at one time. Adam and Eve had the DNA, had the ability, had the cells to live past 900 years, and so did Methuselah and so forth, and we lost it pretty rapidly after the flood when men went from 600 down to 400. But to enumerate specifically, their teeth were better. They had what we would call torodont molars. Torodont means bull-like, which are much longer lasting molars, sort of like a radial tire compared to the old-fashioned tire. It's a modern type of tire, it can go 50,000 or so miles. The torodont molar was a bull-like tooth that could repair itself inside, and I believe outside as well. I believe they had a stronger saliva, which I document in the book, and I believe they had some sort of enamel repair based upon my calculations of enamel wear rates, which we don't have today. I think the baby molars also, which we know were torodont, also lasted a long time. Now, why would baby molars have to last a long time unless they stayed in the mouth for many, many years? In ours today, most children lose their baby molars by the time they're 12 or 13 years of age. We have occasionally some that are retained when there's no permanent tooth under it, and they can go into the 20s. But Neanderthal child seemed to hold on to these baby teeth. It's called protracted eruption, developed late, uh, wore for a long time, and lost them in the late 20s and early 30s. And this is a fact that I've discovered. So therefore, we know the teeth are better. We know from the, our cave explorations, and I've done some of this myself, that when these early caves were discovered in France, some of them had crystalline white walls with beautiful paintings on these walls. Now, these were deep caves, and they were pitch black inside, very, very dark. And for these people, uh, light meant fire, and fire usually always means smoke. Therefore, you have uh, a wall that's painted with colors on a white background and no smoke. We must postulate that they had better eyes. Uh, Alexander Marshak from Harvard University wrote a whole book on the eyes of Upper Paleolithic man, not realizing that Upper Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, and Lower Paleolithic are probably all the very same time period. But he showed that there are microscopic carvings that we today cannot read without a very powerful magnifying glass or a microscope. When I became a Christian in 1975, I had uh, this interest uh, in the scriptures uh, from the standpoint of speaking with Dr. Francis Schaeffer. He had explained that when man fell, everything around man fell, everything that man had dominion over fell at the same time, and um, mankind had been going through this progressive fall, as Paul describes in Romans. My initial uh, response to that was, we should be seeing it in humans. I s immediately put two and two together. I was seeing it in my office. Uh, the fall, of course, meaning that children uh, were maturing quicker and quicker. I looked in Genesis 11, and I saw the ages of the men in Genesis that they aged uh, quite rapidly as compared, uh, Genesis 11 compared to, say, the early chapters of Genesis before the flood. And um, then I said that, uh, I needed to do more work in anthropology. I had a lot of experience in graduate school on study of teeth and bones, 
And as a new Christian, I wanted to be able to investigate this subject uh, on a deeper level. I was not always a creationist. And, and then I realized that there were very few uh, places that would accept evolution in the scriptures, especially in Genesis. Actually, there was no place to put Genesis. I realized that there couldn't be death before sin, the actual physical death. I realized that there couldn't be uh, any blood in the ground because the blood in the ground uh, that would have been there in the early chapters of Genesis, say Genesis 1, would uh, have been called very good by God. And that would have been a complete contradiction because when Cain murdered Abel later on, he didn't seem to like that very much. And he said, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Therefore, that wasn't so good. And why was this early blood good? So there was a complete dichotomy there. And I started to put two and two together. It came up with some theories, not knowing how they would test out uh, based upon my actual observing of these things. But then, of course, the fossil record uh, provided uh, the answers that I found and I put in this book. Neanderthals, as it turned out, have the most uh, largest number of fossils in the world. They're scattered around the world. And there are more Neanderthals than any other fossil. And just to make a quick note about this, Fossils themselves should be fossilized, should have a certain percentage of the bone composed of stone uh, minerals. And yet the Neanderthals that I observed and x-rays had very little fossilization in the bones at all, which means they weren't very old. Uh, there's only one completely fossilized or almost totally fossilized skull, and it wasn't a really Neanderthal. It was from Broken Hill in Zambia. But the Neanderthals comprise around 500 skeletons, um, not complete, of course, 500 individuals. They count very funny, and I talk about this in the book. But 12 complete skeletons out of those 500, and they're supposed to cover 200,000 years. And I don't think any of that matches up, because uh, to have that few number of skeletons for 200,000 years doesn't make any sense. And what did you hope to accomplish with this study? Well, my goals were to determine the ages, the chronological ages of these individuals. There are dental ages, uh, skeletal ages, and chronological ages. And that follows through for mankind at this point in time as well. And I had a feeling that there was some contradictory evidence in the fossil record because of the fact that um, Neanderthals had these str very strange looking heads and they were far down the line from the early apes. So there must have been some reason for this configuration or characters of the cranium of the Neanderthals. For instance, the large brow ridges, the very forward faces, the huge nasal and eye openings, the uh, protrusion of the teeth, the flatness of the chins. All these things seem to have a reason. And as it turned out, some clues came from modern American research on aging in adults as to what these characters actually were. You see, if man lived to two, three, four, five hundred years, perhaps even more as we see in the early part of Genesis, in post-flood times, Shem was 600 years of age. If man lived this long, would his head then reflect the changes that we see in a very minor form in our adults? And I thought that this study would be fruitful because if these skulls existed, they must be somewhere. The same kind of changes that take place in our adult skulls are the changes that we would call today Neanderthalization. The actual sizes uh, of the skulls, and I didn't realize this until I came upon a Neanderthal quote unquote teenager in Berlin. Now this served as our base. I had already studied four Neanderthal children found them to be changed and manipulated so they didn't show immaturity, but they were very immature. They aged very, very slowly. Then when I came to the adults, I realized that the adults had certain characteristics in their skulls that would look very much like we would look if we lived to say three to 400 years. The University of Michigan had some data that I gave to my son-in-law at the University of Texas, a PhD there at this point now, previously working on it. And Brian took this material and extrapolated it out from Michigan, a longitudinal study on adults living from their uh, 20s and 30s into their 80s. And what it turned out to be, and you'll see this in the book, that if we lived to the great old ages of the people in the Bible, lived to, we would look very much like the Neanderthals. And it worked out that the measurements from the lower jaw 
measurements, the tooth measurements, the protrusion of the teeth, the uh, protrusion of the jaws, the protrusion of the, and the slope of the anterior part of the face, and the, the processes above the eyes, the brow ridges, and the various shapes and sizes that I've measured all turned out to reflect this great age from the Neanderthal teenager, supposedly, which I believe to be in his 30s actually, to the men that I think are at least 250 to 350 perhaps older, like La Chapelle aux Saints and La Ferrassie number no. one from France. These are the classic Neanderthals. This is the typical picture of a very, very ancient person who lived to an old age. The bones in the face and the head never stop growing. Our long bones get thicker, not much taller. We don't grow in height. They do grow in thickness, the compact bone, but the bones of the face are very unique as well. A lot of things take place and they continuously grow as long as we live. You have a hat and it fits you at age 25 and uh, you'd like to try it on now, uh, then you'll see that it probably won't fit at this age that you're at this present time. After a few days in France visiting some caves and uh, doing some exploring around, we decided to go right to the Musée de l'Homme in Paris. The very first skull I picked up was a little Neanderthal child called Peche de la Aze, or Peche de la Az. He was supposed to be about two and a half years old, and his teeth were not supposed to go together in what we call occlusion. They were not supposed to meet properly. And the jaw was not supposed to go into the hinge point. And I had a book in front of me that Dr. Krogman had given me with a description of this skull in it and pictures of the skull. And I held the skull in my hand put the teeth together in occlusion and wondered if I did something wrong because the teeth fit together properly. Not only did they fit together properly, in this new position, the whole face looked very, very small. Then I thought back to my agreement with Dr. Copan so that I would hand in all my duplicate x-rays for my work at the museum that week. And I thought I was going to be in a lot of trouble if I readjusted the position of these jaws. But having truth as one of my basic presuppositions, I decided I had to do this and put it in the correct occlusion. After all, if I was an orthodontist and I didn't know how teeth went together, I'm in big trouble. I mean, I've been doing, I was doing that for quite a while. So I did, and this went on. This was not just the first skull this happened to. The next skull was an adult called La Chapelle aux Saints, I'd mentioned before, the very, very old man. And I did this as well, put the teeth in proper occlusion. He only had two of them that were in uh, occlusion. But each time I found that what they had done is adjusted the skull, the lower jaw particularly, so that this individual looked more ape-like or more mature as far as the children are concerned. And so what they were trying to do, it seemed to me, was to hide this immaturity, as Paul says in Romans, to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I saw it all right before my eyes and I trembled. And then of course we had a lot of problems getting out of France and we had a lot, as the book describes, there was a chase, we locked ourselves a number of times in rooms to avoid the different people that were trying to take these x-rays back from us. It would be nice if science was open like everyone thinks it is, but in the world of anthropology there's such things as political reconstructions, as Dr. Alan Walker would say from Penn State, or there are such things as just reconstructions due to your presuppositions. The Bible says, as a man thinks, so he is. As a person thinks within himself, so we will adjust certain bones to fit the needs of the hour or the evolutionary presuppositions that he believes in. So if you believe that these particular people were uh, advanced in their development in relation to modern man, uh, as an ape would be advanced, say an ape is twice as uh, rapid in development as modern men are in development, then you would adjust the fossils to show that. One of the things I believe they knew was that the biblical basis for growth was a slower development back in time and history. Because if you lived five to 600 years, you didn't have a childhood of 12 to 13 years. It was obvious, many people have said this. And of course the Bible, as I mentioned before, talks about people who matured in Genesis 11 in the vicinity of 30 years of age. So what I was working with was a child that had developed very late and kept his baby teeth very long and they did everything in their power to try to keep this material from being known. I didn't realize this until I went on to Great Britain and the British Museum and I saw this in Gibraltar two skull. Then I went to the Angus skull in Belgium and I saw the very same thing and then I was super astonished in Berlin when I saw Le Moustier, a French Neanderthal teenager, that they had made into the most ape-like reconstruction you can possibly imagine. It was incredible. 
The skull was constructed of totally of plastic in the case downstairs in the museum. It looked nothing at all like the real pieces of skull and the bones as I put them together upstairs in the laboratory. And you'll see this in the book. And the license which they had in order to do this, because basically they believe that there isn't anyone else that's really checking them, and whatever they say, people are going to take for granted as being truthful. And in a way, our American high school teachers and American college professors have never seen this kind of subterfuge and never would believe it happened unless I've been able, unless someone is able to document it in a book like this. And I hope I have been able to. So we don't take this hook, line, and sinker and accept it as truth. There are political reconstructions. They are playing games with us. I heard it in the British Museum. They think we know nothing. And they laugh. And I think this book is going to prove otherwise. This is not just a book of words. As my son Joshua would say, this is a book of pictures. Of course, there's a lot of theory in it, but the pictures tell the story. The pictures show how these skulls have been adjusted to hide the biblical immaturity. Some of these skulls scream immaturity. Some of these skulls, for instance, the Zambian skull screams out disease. This has all been suppressed. There was this actual skull in, uh, that we use for our cover of this book called the Laquina Number no. 5 and where the chin was actually chopped off and sawed off. I was in the lab the day the man actually did this. And this was to give it a more ape-like appearance. So what I am saying, and it's with tears, it's not because I'm happy to be able to find all this. This is with great tears that I'm finding this. Because for too long, the American public, the public of the world has been fooled that this science of paleoanthropology tells the truth all the time. Now, I'm not condemning every single one of them. There are some honest men out there. What I am saying is that too many times, no one checks up on what they have. And as I said before, as a man thinks, so he is. So they will adjust the fossils to their belief system that they hold inside their minds. They come into the laboratory with a preset notion of what these bones should look like. Uh, and then, of course, if they don't look like that, they'll adjust them in such a manner as they can within certain boundaries to be able to uh, put them into that uh, position. Uh, and I found this in four museums with the four Neanderthal children from uh, Angus, Moustier, Peche de Oz, and Gibraltar too. And then with La Chapelle Sans, they adjusted the jaw so it didn't look basically the posterior position or the backward position. What that means is they made the Neanderthal children have larger faces because they contended that age for age Neanderthals should look larger for their size, for each of the size of their heads. And this makes each one of them look protruded or more ape-like and of course more mature. And that led to the problem of us never discovering or anyone never knowing that there was immaturity in the fossil record amongst Neanderthals. These were post-flood men who lived to long ages. Their heads became very strange looking. Their bones all started to distort. They had arthritis. Uh, they didn't have rickets or syphilis that has been reported, but they had uh, basically the diseases that you receive when you live a long time, which is primarily arthritis. But their heads changed dramatically because all heads change as we age. And believe me, if you could have seen Noah at age 600 or 700, he would have looked exactly like a Neanderthal. Not only that, could they speak, they had all the necessary anatomy in order to speak and communi communicate properly and develop. And I think uh, that basically their physical makeup of their bodies were far beyond what we would ever possibly think about today. They live these ages naturally. If we get to 100, we've done it because of antibiotics, we've done it because of modern medical and technology care. I can go back to a discovery in Griswold, Connecticut. There was a group of burials in a large sand pit in Griswold, Connecticut that was discovered. And in it, there was a particular coffin with uh, brass tacks on it. Uh, there was no headstone on this individual uh, this coffin, near the coffin. And what he had was a little, I believe it was a boy, we're not 100% sure, was the words NB, the initials NB, age 13 on the coffin. When the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology decided to do a, a study on these children, and this is the only one they actually had a chronological date for, that he was that old, they took this material down to Washington and it scared them to death, because when I went down there to look at it, little NB age 13, quote unquote around 16, late 16, early 1700s, turned out to be, by our modern dental standards, around nine and a half to 10 years of age. Meaning this, that a child of the 1700s did in 13 years 
what it takes our child today only nine and a half to ten years to do. So that little child was slow developing and he was early American history. Now if we just extrapolate back into time and think about what perhaps Neanderthal, how they developed and why they developed that way, it becomes a very biblical story. It fits right in with the scriptures. Man being created perfect and then falling after the sin in the Garden of Eden and then God saying, from dust you came unto dust you shall return. And everyone started to die gradually, gradually and each generation went downhill from that point on. And our systems became sort of inoperational. And as we, modern science came in and technology came in, we began to prop ourselves up again. And now we think we're doing something really great by living to 75 or 80 years of age. And where in reality, that's very much an artificial number. I was trained in the study of growth and development of bones of the face and the head. An orthodontist can do nothing with a child, or with an adult for that matter, unless he knows how the shape of the bones are going to affect his treatment. And is the bone itself going to help us as we go on in our treatment, or is it going to be fighting against us? We need to know that, so we need to be able to make predictions of growth in children. So our bony studies, anatomical studies in physical anatomy of the skull and the face was very extensive not only in dental school but in graduate school of orthodontics and then we use the cephalometric x-ray which is a an amazing tool it takes the head of a, either a live person or a fossil and puts it in a standardized position from that point we can x-ray it and we will get no distortions if it is adjusted properly in the cephalostat which is the holder then we can compare it to modern standards and that's exactly what I did I just applied what I do in my office every day and what every orthodontist does that's in the American Association of Orthodontists they take uh, children and x-ray them and then apply standards to those children to see how they're growing and I did this to the fossils as a matter of fact this very first little Neanderthal child that I studied turned out to be smaller than in his face not in his cranium there's two sections to the head the face is one and the cranium that the upper part of the head is the other smaller in his face than even a modern one-year-old he was sort of about the size of a child in the uterus his face was very 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 tiny uh, I found out from that that this child would have taken a lot longer to mature to a Neanderthal teenager than anyone would have ever thought because of that tiny little face or he was the most rapidly developing child on the face of this earth. So there's either two choices. Either this child grew at rates beyond anything we know of and beyond even the apes, which are two times as fast. These rates would have to be four or five times faster, perhaps even more, for this child to reach the teenage size. And then for the teenager, supposedly, which I've calculated to be around 30 years old, to grow into an adult, some of his measurements would have to go to 8 to 10 to 12 times faster than modern man just to get to that size. So we're at the point where we must say to the scientific world, either we're looking at the world's fastest growth rates or a very, very long period of time in between these stages of development. What we have not had as a general knowledge in this country is the knowledge that we're going downhill. And that's what I want to provide because it is the source of all mankind's problems. Paul outlines it very well in Romans. We're all suffering the slavery to decay. And it's a gradual process. But our body is gradually, it can adapt to these various circumstances. Modern science is holding us up, but we're going downhill. That should probably be one of the big contributions because if we can look at mankind as this, we can go backwards into history, look at animals as more complex, look at mankind as more complex, and study ancient enzymes. As I've mentioned in the book, my son John studies enzymes, but he's written a part of the back of the book for me. He's a PhD at MIT. And what he has said to me, he said, Dad, these ancient enzymes are much better, much more efficient than the, than the enzymes we have today. And so what we're looking at are enzymes, we're looking at eyes, we're looking at teeth, we're looking at larger brain, we're looking at stronger muscles, better bone, uh, just a lot of better things. And what we have seen now is that the process, at least I've seen it from the time of Neanderthals to modern man at this point, is that the body has gone in this downhill position and we're sliding pretty fast, as evidenced by the rapid maturation of our children start to question a lot of the evolutionary presuppositions because it does color and cause them to change, the evolutionists to change the evidence. So we're not working with the exact same evidence. If evidence were presented to us as it really truly is, and not without the bias, not without the interpretation and the twist they put on it, then perhaps we could come to some conclusions that might lead us towards the mind of God and not away from the mind of God. 
Too often children are led away from the mind of God in the school systems of the United States because they're not allowed to even see the true evidence. And that's what I hope this book, I'd like to see this book in the hands of many children so they can take this into their teachers and say, look, this is what it really looks like. What do you think about this? Bible says we lived a long time. We look in the fossil record and guess what? We actually find people who lived a long time. Now for years, no one's ever known this. They've been there, they're in the drawers. No one's ever brought them out and said, hey, what do they look like? How, do, they, do they look like we would have looked like if we lived to be 500 years of age? And it's true, they do. They look very much the same. Now we've done that from computer studies on aging people in our generation.